Hello comrades, Commissar Bro here today with Romance of the Three Kingdoms 13. That's right. I did a video uh, just a few days ago of uh, actually showing some gameplay of this game. As I mentioned then and I will repeat now, this is probably one of the funnest strategy games I have played in years and is probably my favorite Romance of the Three Kingdoms game I've played since Romance of the Three Kingdoms 10. That's right. It seems to kind of hit a close mix of grand strategy and RPG elements that I very much like. Now, it can be a bit tedious and grindy at times, but for the most part, I really like this game and I think it's an absolute blast. Um, and it, it takes some ideas from Nobunaga's ambition and incorporates it into the RPG elements of some of the older Romance of the Three Kingdoms games. Now, keep in mind, I have not played Romance of the Three Kingdoms uh, 12. I mean, I kind of did. I tried out like an English patch to it, um, but it was really rough and I didn't put a lot of time into it at all. Um, because, like I said, I mean, it wasn't in English, so it was kind of hard to play. But it had some interesting mechanics. Uh, from what I could tell. And I put a lot of time in Romance of the Three Kingdoms 11, which was far more of a base builder kind of game. But unfortunately, Romance of the Three Kingdoms uh, 11 got a little old uh, to me after a while. Now keep in mind, I haven't put as many hours into this game as I have 11, so maybe after some time I'll get tired of this one, but so far I've managed to conquer most of China, in uh, this scenario, as you can see here, I'm the R, and I still have plenty of places to fight uh, before I'm done. But yeah, and I'm and I'm not tired of the game yet. And like I said, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So what I've decided to do now that I've given you that nice, good introduction is I've decided to do a couple of videos here or there, really talking about the game and showing people how to play it, and to show them why I think it's a really cool game. And why I think, you know, it's it's worthy of supporting. Especially, I think this is one of Koi's best games I've played in a long time. Like, I really enjoyed Dynasty Warriors 8. I know a lot of people, I guess, are not... A lot of Americans, anyway, are not huge fans of the Dynasty Warriors series. They see it to be uh, kind of repetitive. And there's not too much changing between each one. But I think Dynasty Warriors 8 had huge improvements uh, over Dynasty Warriors 7 and 6, which I wasn't much of a fan of. And uh, I really want Dynasty Warriors 8 Empire, but I'm so broke. <laughs> but that is my goal, baby. Let me tell you, I plan on getting Dynasty Warriors 8 Empires uh, as soon as I possibly can. But anyway, so let's put a focus back on Romance of the Three Kingdoms 13. As you can see here, my leader, Ranbai Ri, is leading 44,786 men in battle against Cao Cao's forces under Yui Jin, Cao Sun, Cao Chang, or Cao Jiang. And uh, Chen Kun, Ch Chen Kun, I, I can't really pronounce that. Needless to say, uh, these are who we're fighting and we're battling outside of the village of Konyang. Uh, with Cao Cao sending additional reinforcements from Panjang, uh, Gaolan, Cao Chong, and Manchong. But Cao Cao is also fighting forces in the north up near Yi uh, against Yuan uh, which one which Yuan is this? Yuan Tan. That's right, because Yuan Shao is dead. And I'm probably speaking literal Chinese to you right now. So let me give you a very brief kind of explanation of what's going on. So essentially, it's 209 AD. Around 200 AD, or realistically about 192 AD, um, a great rebellion had happened a few years prior. And it was crushed by the coalition, like an out, like a Han coalition, which managed to bring it down. However, after the coalition ended to destroy the Yellow Turban Rebellion, uh, a gentleman known as Dong Zhuo would eventually come into power, pushing all of, like basically turning the Han Emperor into a puppet and so on and so forth. Um, Dong Zhuo would eventually be kicked out of power, and some major countries would come into power, being uh, Cao Cao of Wei, Yuan Shao up here in the north, being the yellow guy, 
and then Sun Jian and so on and so forth. Uh, and Liu Bei, Lu Bu even, I guess you could say. And Ma Tang in the west. So this would be Ma Tang's forces here. I don't know if he's still alive, but Ma, Ma Tang is over here. Now, this is a fictional scenario where I'm actually playing as my own created guy, Ran Bai Rui. And I started here in the bottom left of China. Uh, and I have basically pushed my way through Liu Biao, who was here. And uh, also, I can't remember who was here. Um, this, no, 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 it was the guy that was here. I can't remember <laughs> who it was, but basically I beat the shit out of this guy. I beat the shit out of the guy down here, and now I own all this. And I think it was Chi Chi, Chi Chi down here. And I think this was like uh, Liu Chang, I think it was. I think it was Liu Chang here in the, the west, uh, and it was Liu Biao here. Uh, and then eventually I would take over Qin Yi, where uh, Liu Bei is. Liu Bei is another huge figure in the Three Kingdoms period. Now again, I, I apologize if you have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm trying to sum this up as best as I can. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. This is an incredibly, incredibly detailed period uh, in Chinese history. So in the East, we have Sun Se who uh, is basically in control of these these red areas here. Or actually, no, it's uh, Sun Quan now, I forgot. Sun Se died. Sun Jian was his father, and he died as well. Sun Se took power and then died not too much longer. So now Sun Quan is the leader in this area. As we can see, the dark, like kind of more pinkish red, the brighter uh, kind of red, like the lighter red over here would be me. Uh, this over here is Li Chu, and uh, like I said, this would be Sao Tsao, uh, and this would be whichever Yuan is in power. It's not Yuan Shao, and it's not Yuan Shu, it's uh, Yuan Tan, I think it is. Again, I don't know, I don't remember how to, let me see, how do I check that? I'm trying to figure out how to check who the actual ruler is, and I don't remember how to do that. Um, but anyway, it's not that important. What is important is we have formed a coalition against Cao Cao. Uh, all the major parties essentially are fighting against this one blue nation here. And that's actually why my men are engaging uh, in this major battle here. That's right. Now I could take control of this battle if I wanted to and I probably will in time. But we're not going to do that. So now that we have a basic understanding of what's currently going on. Uh, to at least some degree. Let's take a look at some ways that you can actually play this game. The, c the city that I currently have under my control, direct control, it's Xiongyang. Uh, so we're going to click on city, and we're going to go in here and we're going to take a look see. Uh, actually, no, I can't yet because I actually have to take control of Ran Bai Rui uh, because this is my avatar, this is actually my person. So the only other way I can really commit any orders or anything is if I take suggestions from my various ministers, which is these three, bo these five boxes here, and then just officers from my other, uh, my other cities that I'm not directly controlling. So I'm going to click here, and it seems that Liu Cho suggests that we train horse in Wu Ling. What say you? So essentially, training a proficiency, and in this case, we would be training horse proficiency leads to having more effective troops. When you reach 1000 proficiency, your troops get upgraded from light to heavy. When it gets to 2000, they get upgraded to elites. Um, and you can even get, like, if you conquer certain villages, they provide certain bonuses like armored infantry, or Han infantry, or, um, there's another one, Eastern infantry, stuff like that. So basically, we're going to say, yeah, we want to do that. Now, you basically give a time period, uh, like a work goal, like what number do you want them to hit? Do you want them to hit 40? Do you want them to hit 60, 80, or 100? Now, when you click on these numbers, it shows you how much merit he will get. Basically, that's like prestige in this game. And it's not really important for you as a ruler to get, but for your officers, it's important because it shows how effective your officers are, if they're being utilized properly, and how much work they're doing. Now, aside from merit, you also have dates, like how many days is it going to take to 
do the act in this case. So if we want to hit a work goal of 80, it would only take 90 days. If we want to hit a work goal of 60, it would only take 70 days, and so on and so forth. And as we can see here, 40 and 60, there's no difference in time. So it would make far more sense for us to at least do 60 days, right? So we're going to say 60, it'll be 70 days, it's going to cost us 200 gold. This gold comes directly out of the acting city. So if you see here, 276,482 gold is how much it's going to cost for him to train. Uh, or was that's how much total gold they have and it's going to cost 200 for him to train these horses. I'm actually going to put it up to 80 because I like 90 days far more. I think it's far more effective, might as well just go for the big bucks. You know what? No, let's go for 100. 100 days, and we're going to approve that mission. A good idea indeed. Another system in this game that's important to mention is the rapport system. Basically, your relationship with your officers. Liu Cho, as you can see here, has a rapport of 33 with me. Now, a rapport is on a scale of negative 100 to 100. Negative 100 being they hate your fucking guts, and 100 being they love you absolutely um, when you hit 80 rapport with somebody um, they basically have to you have to upgrade they, they they become like best friends with you essentially but the only way it's gonna get higher is if you build more like you you commit uh, like you fight in battles or you you have banquets and you invite them to banquets and stuff like that so lots of stuff going on there um, we're going to go ahead and take Mi Chu's suggestion, which he suggests that Yu Tsui uh, cultivates its fields. What is our reply? I like that idea. I think that's a good idea. Now, how long do I want to do it for? Do I want to hit a work goal of 40? That's going to take 90 days. Or maybe 200. It's going to take 290 days. Let's do 200. Yeah. And Mi Chu. His rapport has gone up with me. Listening to your officers, essentially, makes your officers like you more. Now, if we want to take command of this battle, we can, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to press play. Oh, and here's another screen I can go ahead and show you guys. An inquiry on what facility to build in Wudao's commerce has arrived from the governor, Wei Yan. So, we've already built a tavern and a merchant house. We can build an arena. Essentially, every thousand, again, just like the proficiency with your, your bows and your horses and so on and so forth, you actually get uh, these buildings that you can build. You have four in each class. So if it's commerce, or if it's farm, or if it's culture, and they provide passive bonuses if you use them to continually upgrade that area. So we're going to do arena because this is a place to earn money, and I dig it. So we're going to build that. Yep, we're going to build the arena. So now basically they can choose the arena to make money while they're upgrading the commerce in that city. What to build in Jianning's commerce to arrive from Governor Wulan. Same thing happening here. And sometimes you get different buildings depending on the city. We're going to do a brewery because that additional effect of plus 15 is nasty. And we're going to definitely get that. Alright, now look, there's more stuff. Oh, goodness gracious. Reduces working time, great farm. We're actually going to do a great farm because it increases the governor experience by plus 6. That's something that everyone in this game has. Everyone in this game actually has stats, which we'll take a look at real quick after I get this particular message. Which is basically because I'm such a badass and I'm so successful, the Emperor is promoting me. And I've actually been promoted to Prime Minister for my outstanding service to the Han Emperor. Uh, meaning, basically all my abilities are plus 9 and I have a troop strength of plus 12,000. And because I've become so well known, I'm impressing more officers every single day. Three months left on the coalition against South Cao. If you do not participate, relationship will worsen with the members. I will announce the earned honors for spring for our force. This essentially is a screen that every season there's going to be honors that are given out. In this case, Huatsui, which is my wife in the game, uh, has got the highest merit and she ranks up, thus making it to where she can be promoted to higher titles, uh, giving her better abilities and so on and so forth. So that's why merits are important for your officers rather than it being important for you. Alright, proud of you. Keep up the good work. So our dudes are fighting. As you can see, my main army of 42,000 is engaging with South Sal's forces, which are completely outnumbered. 
and we are dominating them. Sao Sao is a force to be feared, undoubtedly. If you look him up in real and actual history, if you've ever seen the movie Battle of or if you've ever seen the movie Red Cliff, or if you've ever played a Dynasty Warriors game, you know who Sao Sao is. He's a pretty bad son of a bitch. So we need to be very, very uh, careful with him. Like, the Dynasty Warriors games tends to depict him as kind of a Nobuna, like an Oda Nobunaga, uh, Nobunaga uh, type character. Kind of a, a tough, no-nonsense, eccentric military kind of leader, I guess you could say. He's, he was really tough and really successful in his lifetime. Uh, needless to say, let's take a look at officers. Let me see if I can't get a screen pulled up for you guys. Alright, so here we go. I have here my officer, another officer I've created named Mu Yi. Mu Yi, like I said, is an officer I've actually created myself. Um, he is now 40 years old and you can see a whole bunch of little stats right here on the basic one screen. You can see more stats here on basic two, how much merit he's gotten, how much he gets paid uh, every month what his preferences are, what his rapport is with me, and what our status is uh, together. He would be a sworn sibling. You can get individual stuff, and you can also get a biography on him. So let's focus on this first. The great thing about this game is these are all your skills, right? And there's tool tips that pop up literally telling you what each one does. So I'm not going to bother explaining each one of them because to a degree, it's kind of obvious what they do. For example, commerce. It increases your effectiveness in markets. It makes it when you upgrade commerce, you get more of a bonus from it. So I'm going to focus instead on like leadership and war, intelligence and governance. So these are the four main stats of the game. Leadership, war, and intelligence having major effects on how your troops perform in a battle. Uh, war essentially being like their attack. Um, leadership affecting their morale and, and intelligence affecting their defense and even like how, how much it costs to use their special abilities in battle. Simple stuff, right? Simple stuff. Now basically as they do, as they do acts related to these abilities, they actually get leveled up as you can see with the experience bar so ev even if a, a general is like really low over time he can get better he may not be the best but he can get better uh, throughout his lifetime governance if it wasn't obvious enough of, is more of an effect on uh, his governing ability if you put him in charge of like a city how effective he is doing various things like increasing commerce or increasing farms so on and so forth um, and this, is there really anything else to mention about that? I guess not, really. That's kind of the, that's the main gist of it. You've also got uh, his fort, a forte, like what they're best at. In this case, Mu Yi is good at training soldiers, uh, making them more more proficient in their particular, uh, you know, fighting style of their horse or bow or spear. Um, he's got, like I said, 60,000 merit, and he's a rank one. His title is he's a northern officer. Uh, of the officer of subjugation in this case so he gets stats based on that like how many troops he can command and he gets a plus six bonus to his war and a plus six bonus to his leadership making him far more effective in a very very deadly foe to say the least look at that war 94 that's terrifying of course I haven't made him as powerful as uh, yours truly because like I said you know this was my first playthrough so I kinda made my characters a little overpowered um, but see, you've actually got real heroes that existed at this time, like Xiao Yun, uh, who have some ridiculous stats in themselves. Uh, like I said, look at his war, it's 96 and his leadership's 93. Xiao Yun, again, for those who may not know, was known to be a very fearsome warrior, uh, who fought un for Shu, uh, initially for Gang Sun Zan, uh, but eventually would fight under Liu Bei and became one of his five tiger generals. Yeah, so you can see he's got all sorts of good stuff, expertise, type, forte, specialty is. He's got all sorts of good stuff. He's a damn good general and a very terrifying foe on the battle, uh, the battlefield to say the least. So that's, that's something else to keep in mind. So there's a lot of stuff I could talk about this game. And I mean, I've been going on and on and on. And at this time, your mind is probably mush. I apologize for that. 
But I hope you've enjoyed this video. We will take a look more at Romance of the Three Kingdoms 13 in the future, where I'll probably go more in depth. I might even do a series on this game. It's a really hard game to do a series on because there's a lot of tedious action going on in the game, but I imagine with some editing, we could probably pull it off. And if that's something you guys would like to see, I'd love to do it. The Three Kingdoms period of China is probably one of the most interesting periods of, like, Chinese history I have ever, ever had the pleasure of studying in my life. Like, it's so interesting. And there's especially, like, even, even if you take the romance, the actual book, uh, but I think his name was uh, Guangzhou. If you actually take his stories out of it and you kind of just focus on the actual real life history, historical accounts of what was said, this is an incredibly interesting period of history full of betrayal, full of huge battles. I mean, absolutely titanic battles that completely dwarf anything that was going on in Europe and in the West. Uh, at the same time, it's just so so impressive. Like what the like what's going on? Like I don't know. It's 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 a very very interesting period that's been heavily documented, and like many Chinese people, from my understanding, view it as a, a almost like a heroic er, era of time. Um, I would almost compare it to like ancient Greece, like how many Westerners view ancient Greece. You could almost say that like the Three Kingdoms period of China, like under the Han and so on and so forth, like how important that was. Because you still have figures like Guan Yu and Zhuge Liang who are revered today. Zhuge Liang, you could almost say, was like how we Westerners view intelligent men like Albert Einstein. Uh, Chinese revere Zhuge Liang in the same way, seeing him as like an incredibly intelligent man, a genius in his time, who was able to do things that no normal man could have. And just like his strategies, he's widely considered as one of the greatest strategists of all time, right up there with Confucius or Sun Tzu, or not Confucius, sorry, uh, with Sun Tzu and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's really interesting, and there's a lot of really cool history going on back here. So, this is something I'm incredibly excited about, and I would love to do more videos about this particular game. Uh, and even if we're just talking about the Three Kingdoms period of China, that's something I would be more than happy to talk about, as it's something I find incredibly interesting. So, if that's something that you guys would like to see, let me know. Hell, we could even just do a couple videos where we talk about, like, lore or something. Because, like I said, these games go so in-depth with telling the story, the actual Romance of the Three Kingdoms story, that, I mean, it's hard to... It's hard not to know, to at least some degree, what's going on. And every game has more to tell of this story, even though it's been told a thousand times. So, but anyway, this has been Commissar Bro. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.